I started about three years ago, went on my own, made every mistake going. My wife will book me onto your pound event course. And then when I went, it was just like, bang, light bulb moment. I came home and I was like, we're doing everything wrong. What's the total value of the whole portfolio that you've got now? Be a minimum of 1.3 million. You can either invest in your education or you pay for your mistakes. That's it with property is, if you do it right, it's very passive. 275 we paid for it. We've got a 60 grand refurb on it and the commercial refinance on it, we're looking at 460. I feel like the property game is like, I'm in a corridor and there's doors everywhere. You've got to break through that door and then you come to another door and then I joined Academy and I feel like you are there just kick it door through yeah. and then I just walk through it I'm like oh that was easy James congratulations on your huge success in property you've been buying all kinds of big properties yeah. in your hometown why don't you just talk a little bit about how you got into property and what you've been doing Thank you. So I started about three years ago in total. Uh, went on my own, obviously, like everybody does. Um, made every mistake going. Um, I bought a property, flicked it into an HMO. Spent way too much money on it. Made it really nice. Big issue with council on that one because uh, I learned hard way straight away. They told me that I didn't have to get tenants in it before Article 4 came in. I just had to finish it, which I did. So then we tenanted it, all going well. Then when I come to refinance it, after I'd come to your pound event and then thought, hang on a minute, why am I paying a repayment mortgage? Let's get it refinanced, pull some money back out on it. Then when I did that, they wanted a certificate of lawful development and then the council declined it um, because our ASTs didn't start until after Article 4. Did um, you lose money? No, I didn't lose money, um, but I'd, I'd, I couldn't keep renting it as an HMO like we'd planned so we had to drop it down to two tenants and then I did a bit of digging and found a loophole that I could then rent it out to an assisted living company because that falls under category 3b and we'll go into that in detail yeah. later yeah. for sure which is, so, which is great when we met was that your only property that, that was my only done? property yeah which had been a little bit of a disaster uh, yeah to say the least yeah. yeah yeah I mean you often hear me say you can either invest in your education or you pay for your mistakes. Exactly, yeah, and we paid for those mistakes. Yeah. Um, and then I swore I was never gonna make a mistake like that again. And then I come across you on YouTube, and I was like, who's this? Every time I typed a question in, you'd pop up on a video. And I was like, this guy knows his stuff. And then uh, it was my wife who booked me onto your pound event course. And right up to that morning, I weren't, I weren't gonna go. I was like, oh, I don't need to go, I don't need to go. And then when I went, it was just like, bang, light bulb moment. Yeah. I came home and I was like, we're doing everything wrong. Um, completely changed everything that we're doing. And then I went back to the uh, BRR to uh, an SA course. Yeah. And then I was hooked and I was like, this is what I need to do. Then I realized I need to invest in my education because you don't know what you don't know. And there were questions I didn't even know I needed to ask that were getting answered for me. Um, so yeah, then I joined Academy and it just has gone, I have to pinch my sen now because it's just gone absolutely mental. Um, so you've got some big projects on the go. Yeah. What deals have you done or what have you got going on or what's um, happening now? I've sold a couple of deals. I did a bit of deal selling. Um, it took a lot of time because it's not as easy as you think it's going to be to start with, but I got the training, I got set up, sold a couple of deals, made some, some quick, fast cash. But then I thought I need to specialise in what I want to do and that's BRR to HMO. So we started um, investing into that and I got a little bit of cash to start with myself, which I'd built up over years because I used to be a gas plumber and I got my own business. But I soon realised that that weren't going to go far fast. Mm. So then when I did your um, Never Use Your Own Money Again training and then realised that actually there's investors out there who will happily invest their cash into deals when you're guaranteeing them returns and money back and stuff like that and then it's just blown up and now we've got we've just completed on his fifth one which is about to start in about three weeks on refurb we're halfway through a 10 bed at the moment which is a nice project i was looking at the roi again last night on that and even fully managed we're on about a thousand and fifty percent roi a thousand it's ridiculous on it, it's nearly full money art obviously so it's knocking out door at infinite we only leave about five grand in it we paid two hundred and seventy thousand for that yeah. We're pumping 60 grand refurb into it and then um, we'll be looking at on a commercial refinance on conservative figures we'll be leaving about five grand in and that's turning over about 62 grand a year in rent so that's a nice one. 
why do you think not everybody's doing this? Why is everybody not buying houses, pushing the value up and refinancing? Why do some people just save up deposits and dump their money into properties? <sighs> Knowledge, because, and like, you, like I say, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and the HMO strategy, I may, I may be a bit biased here, but I believe that is one of the most difficult strategies. There's so much red tape. When you're starting out, especially when you're on your own, there's so many rules and regulations that you don't know about and you will 100% get bit with them. So once you've done the training and you, you know what you're doing, even now, I mean, I'm on my fifth one and I'm still learning stuff, yeah. little tricks, you know, just to, just to make it happen quicker and easier and get better returns. Um, every day is a school day. I think the fact that HMOs are highly regulated, to me, I think it's a really good thing because Definitely. if it was as easy as just buying a house and then just renting the rooms out, yeah. Everybody, Everybody would do that. Do it, yeah. But because it's highly regulated and you need licensing, there's Article 4, potential planning. Yeah. People think, oh, I don't yeah. want to touch that with a barge pole. There's yeah. also big fines, isn't there? Yeah. If yeah. you do it wrong. Yeah, 30 gram fine. Yeah, yeah. Like bang. Yeah. Or you can even go to prison. Yeah. There's we, some stuff that's criminal. Yeah, which we got not threatened with, but, <laughs> but when we, when we um, applied for a certificate of lawful development, yeah. he, the planning didn't tell us that we couldn't use it as an HMO. But they told us they weren't giving us a certificate on it, and he told us that if we did get investigated, we we could be facing that. So obviously could that was what up to a thirty thousand pound fine. Oh, I thought so, you were in prison. No, well, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too pretty to go to prison. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a, a big learning curve. And to be honest, when that happened, it was like before I joined academy, and I was teaching on edge of just thinking, I'm done with property. Mm. Um, I'm going to go back plumbing because I was earning good money plumbing and eating but I was working very very hard for it and I knew there were going to come a time in my life when I couldn't do it anymore when my knees packed in um, or I wanted to retire and that money would have just stopped yeah. dead unless I'd have built a plumbing and eating business up which I started to do a little bit employing people but I soon realised that that took more time up than it did actually doing the work and I thought I it's very difficult to make that a hands-off business. What I want with the HMR strategy is eventually to be able to hand them over to management companies and they're pretty much passive income. Um, so I can literally have time off, go on holiday, take yeah. kids away, see my wife, just sit at home if I want. I don't mean, I probably never do that, but I'd like the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and for me, that was, that's it with property is it's, if you do it right, it's very passive. It just takes a lot of work to start with. Yeah. And you need people in your corner. You can't do it alone. Not by yeah. the way you are. And I remember you saying to me at one of the events, you said, you are going to be successful in property, whether you joined Academy or not, yeah. which I agree with. But after joining Academy, it's just sped everything up 10 times. Right. And position I'm in now, I think would have taken me while I was 50, another 20, 25 years to get to. And I've done it in eight months. Wow. That's why I have to pinch me saying, because I'm like, yeah. is this happening? I remember saying that to you because I remember saying, look, you will be successful regardless. Yeah. But yeah, it's a case yeah. of, do you want to go on your own? Yeah. Or do you want to be part of a community yeah. where you've got mentors, you've got yeah. training, because yeah. that will be a lot more fun. Definitely. And, and it will it be is, a lot faster. And it is fun, yeah. It is fun, as well yeah. as being all the knowledge and the help that you get. It's, it's yeah. fun. The uh, amount of people that I've met who I like a lot and are class as friends now, that you would never meet. You can go to a networking event and meet some people. You might think, oh, they're all right. But you don't really get to know them as such. Mm -hmm. You might swap contact details. You might have some emails back and forth. But in the academy, you're thrown in a mix together and you're with them people a lot and you get to know people on a real personal level. Mm. And I've met some really, really good people, aren't they? How many units do you own now then? We're just coming up to 29. Wow, now. that's so, amazing. And we're looking at buying another two this year. Are, um, are you getting commercial valuations or are you getting bricks we're and doing, mortar? Yeah, we've got one which is just about to complete the refurb this week actually, um, which is a six bed. So we're going to try on a commercial refinance on that. Obviously six beds can be a little bit in a grey yes, area, okay. but it's full on suited. It's over four floors. It'd be quite difficult to put it back to a residential. So we're confident on that to get a, a commercial or at very least a good hybrid valuation. Yes. And then it's 10 bed 
we nailed on to get a commercial on that one. That cannot go back 100%. to a residential, yeah. The, the 10 bed, what are the figures as to how much did you buy it for? We bought it for 270. And what was it? Was it just a house? It was very, it, it was a seven month purchase, this one. It was, it was very sketchy. So originally it was a house, then it got changed to a HMO. Then they got a classy planning on it to change it to officers, which it never actually got changed. They carried on using it as an HMO, which technically were illegal because it were down as officers. They run that then for 15 years. And then three years ago, they didn't renew really a license on it and it was sat empty. So it was sat empty on a class E classification. So Ouch. I know, and the property is stunning. It's such a nice looking house, but they sold off a big part of the back garden because at one point it was a hostel. So they split the title and they built a um, warden's house. So the back garden's really tiny, so it can't go back to a, a residential. So we had a, a long battle with council, that's why it took seven months to, to actually, yeah. from offer going in to get it keys, because we needed to make sure that we could do it as a HMO, because to split it up into flats, studio apartments, which would have been as, as, as backup plan, we'd have just about rock even on it. Mm -hmm. We couldn't possibly sell it as an house, so we needed to get, we needed to get planning on it. And we were in an Article 4 area, very anti HMO. It's also a conservation area, that street. But no one would touch that with a barge pole. I know, I know. But because the figures got... are so good on it. Like I say, it's 270 or 275 we paid for it. We've got a 60 grand um, refurb on it. Yeah. And the commercial refinance on it, conservatively, we're looking at 460. So what would the profit on that, about 100 grand? Yeah, easy. Over 100 grand profit? Yeah. So figures we leave about 5,000 in the deal. So you'll refinance it then? Yeah. Talk me through the process of buying a house, refurbing it and refinancing it? So we generally buy them at a low value, i.e. when they need a lot of work, so we can add value to it. We purchased at 270, we put a 60 gram refurb into it, so we're like 330 in. So we'll then approach a lender when, when it's completed, they'll send a new guy out to value it, then we kind of like sell it back to the lender as such, and they'll release us 75% of the total value. It'll pay off all of his refurb money minus five grand, um, and then it'll leave 25% in deal on a standard HMO or commercial mortgage. Yeah. Um, and what do you think the profit will be on that? Profit on that, we're looking about 35 grand a year. Yeah, about 50% of the... Yeah, of, just, of, just less. We usually yeah. knock about 40% off for bills and everything, because we do make them really well insulated, a good high efficiency eating system. I'm a gas plumber by trade, so I know what system you supporting that. You just fixed that our toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no charge as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I know what system supporting, just to try and keep bills down. Yeah. Um, we've not been single banded on it yet. If that comes in or not, I don't know, but as of now, we're, we're lucky with it. So yeah, we, we're looking mid thirties profit on it. I've joint ventured on that one as well. So you got someone to put the money in? Yeah. How much did you put into that deal? Up to now, zero. At all? Nothing? Nothing, no. So I'm, I'm doing all the work, the sweat equity of it. Oh, wow. And what I've done is I've got, we've got a contract drawn up between us that the investor gets a minimum of 75% of his money back on the refinance. And I cover him as well. So if for any reason it fell through on the GDV, on the value, if it, if it got downvalued, which is very unlikely, but if it did, he's covered that he gets a larger percentage, 75% of the rent income. Sure. I'll manage it as well, do any repairs until he's, it is 75% back right. and then we split it. So it, the investor's covered every which way. Yes. They can't possibly lose out. But looking at the figures, as I said, he's, he's due to get full money back in less than eight months. And I think every joint venture, I mean, there's always an element of risk. With, with any deal you do, yeah, yeah. even driving to work, you could get, yeah. it, it, it can have a car accident, there's always yeah. risk. Yeah. But what you need to do is you need to make sure that every joint venture, there's equal risk and equal reward. Yeah. So not one person's taking yeah. all of the risk, you're spreading the risk. Yeah, my risk is obviously time, Yeah. because I'm putting a lot of time into this. I mean, I'm working six, seven days at the minute, up until late at night, ordering materials for builders, organizing everything. I'm actually hands on the project as well, more or less every day, so time-wise, I'm, I'm, I would lose a lot. The investor is obviously cash, so he he don't have to come, he don't have to do anything. He's just injected the cash and just waits for his, his return. Mm. Um, How did you find the investor to put in all the money? The first day I joined the academy, uh, back in end of June, I signed up that day and that evening, about four or five hours after, we had an academy dinner, which was my first academy dinner. Um, and I went in 
And I was going to sit on a table with a guy who I'd been chatting with earlier that day. And he wa he sat down in that what last seat, took on that table. So I'm like, oh, it's fine, I'll go somewhere else. So I looked about and I just randomly went and sat next to a guy. We, we sat chatting. He wanted to invest in HMOs. He weren't too sure on the strategy then because um, he was he were brand new. He'd signed up that day as well. So I told him what we'd been doing with ours. And I said to him, well, you know, if I get any good deals at all, I'll... I'll throw me away if you want. So he said, yeah. And it was during that time that I, was, I then started looking at this, this property and found it. And then once I'd learned how to run all figures and get my ROI sheets together, didn't matter which way I put it down, it just kept coming out as a fantastic deal. Um, and I just pitched it to him. Well, I didn't pitch it to him. I showed him it. And he was like, yeah, I'm in straight away. And then since then, we've done another one together as well. So me and him's got two going at the moment. Um, and on GDVs, with both of them, we're looking about 600,000. Uh, What's the total worth or value of the whole portfolio that you've got now, the, the GDV yeah. on the five properties that you've um, got? Conservatively, we're going to be a minimum of 1.3 million. Jeez. That must just <laughs> it's be mental, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I come from a council estate, me. So them kind of numbers to me are just surreal honest to god i can't i i have to pinch myself sometimes i can't i can't believe we're in this situation but then my wife's like yeah we're in this situation because you've put so much time and effort into it and then obviously investment into academy were just literally the best thing i've ever done um, because i would not be here now no way i'd still be doing property but i might have got maybe another one and i'd be struggling and you know i've been knocking me out on wood and whereas <laughs> now it's just like it's like i feel like the property game is like i'm in a corridor and there's doors everywhere. And you come up to a door and you've got to get through it. You've got to break through that door. And then you come to another door. And then I joined Academy and I feel like you were there just kicking door through. Yeah. And then I just walked through it. I'm like, oh, that was easy. And then yeah. I walked through the next one and uh, progress is just happening so fast. It's exciting. It is Talk to exciting. me a bit about the area that you're in. Because the rules are really strict. Yeah. They've even got full to Article 4 in there. Yeah. How yeah. the heck are you doing... Buy, refurbish, refinance to HMO yeah. in an area that's got yeah. complete Article 4, that's really strict, that yeah. are anti HMOs. Oh, yeah. yeah and making so much money. Yeah. What, what tricks and tips can you share? Um, it was very, very difficult in my area. I'm up, I'm up north in South Yorkshire, and like you said, they're very anti HMO. So I had to just learn all the legalities around it all to be able to fight fire with fire, basically. Um, and a good strategy that we're doing is we're buying rundown HMOs that are already C4 classification. Right. So we've got grandfather rights on them. We're buying them at a lower value because they're run down. We're refurbing them, increasing value, and pulling us money back out of it. That's great. So that, that is a Give me an really example of strategy. one of those then. And just to anyone that doesn't understand C4, so it's just the class, what, what, yeah. the, what the classification of the property is. Yeah, so obviously a standard residential uh, property is C3 classification. Yeah, and you um, talked about E, that's just business. That yeah, means it's E's business, offices, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And C4, HMO. C4 is HMO. So if it's already C4, or we've got historical ASTs pre-Article 4, which is a, another saga you have to go when you're buying them, um, then you've got grandfather rights to be able to keep running it as an HMO. But there is an in-between classification as well, um, which we found out. Because of this first one, how we got bit so heavily with it, I did a lot of digging. Uh, I got help from Academy, I got help from solicitors. We then finally nailed down that there's a, there's a classification in between it all called C3B, which even in an Article 4 area, we are allowed to legally go from C3 to C3B under permitted development. And C3B is, there's, there's a few different examples, but one is an assisted living company can rent it off me. So this HMO that we are lumbered with that they won't give us a certificate on to be able to refinance, we are now handing that one over to a assisted living company. We're gonna kind of like do a corporate let to our company. They rent it off me for a fixed amount, completely hands off. We can then refinance it as a C3B classification and we'll be able to pull us money back out of it. And that we can do without permission as long as it's under six and that falls under category C3B. So yeah, we're looking forward now to, to moving on that one. And that might be a strategy that we look at doing permanently because we're building a relationship up with this assisted living company. Yeah. So that means we can start buying them in Article 4 areas we can kit them out as an HMO 
and then we can hand them over to this assisted living company. And then we'll talk about it on YouTube, everyone will do it, and they'll change the rules again. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but we'll it's okay. And then we'll find something else. And then we'll find <laughs> something else, and we'll share that on YouTube Exactly, too. exactly. That's the thing I'd rather share, because yeah. I, I think coming from a position of abundance, so many property investors and developers, that do all these little loopholes and these little hacks, and, they're and really, they keep them to themselves. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think just bring everybody up with you, yeah. because then it's easier to grow. Exactly. If everybody around you is rich, it's easier to get richer. Right. So yeah, I've been sharing that with a lot of Academy members. Which, I know you which have. Like. And they've been loving it. Uh, and they've yeah. been feeding yeah. back to me. I had four phone calls on the way down here actually about HMOs. Wow. Um, and even, you've been so popular, we're actually bringing you down next week to just sit in a, we're going to lock you in a little mentor yeah. box. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It, but we do that at yeah. all the events. At every program that we have, we've got like mentor boxes where if anyone's struggling, they go out, have yeah. some one-on-one -on -one time with somebody yeah. who's more experienced. Which I did when I was brand new into Academy. Yeah. I would have been mentoring calls and meetings, which were absolutely oh, I remember. Great. I remember yeah, the story about your uh, your bad tenant. Yeah, the one that we couldn't get rid of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, talk yeah. about that. What happened? Uh, so we bought a, a HMO um, recently. Well, uh, quite a few months ago now, um, which were a six bed, and it had got four sitting tenants in it. And the previous landlord had Section Twenty One them all, so they had to move out by a few days after we completed, which were a bit bit risky. And three other guys moved out straight away. And one of the guys dug his heels in and he said he weren't going anywhere. So we were like, oh God. So we got a six bed HMO. Builders were booked in to come in on the Monday. And the Monday morning when we got there, he would not leave. And he was meant to have left like a few days before. And so we had to cancel builders. It just turned into a right saga. And obviously, you know what builders are like. If you upset them, then that's it. That, oh, they yeah. just burnt, in it? So we then had to go to plan B and... We looked at if we could do the refurb around him while he was still in, think on his pay, pay no rent either. They'd not paid rent for three months to the previous landlord. And the council were advising him just to sit tight and not move, not give his, his key back. Why so, would they advise him to do that? Because he were our problem and not theirs. And they knew that as soon as he moved out, if he'd got nowhere to go, which obviously we're going to find it difficult because he got three months rent arrears swinging around his neck. So they just wanted him to stay there, basically. So we looked at if we could refurb it around him, but it just weren't logistically possible because we had to change eating system and plumbing system. We were adding on suites and stuff like that. So That would have been a shame for him, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, but legally we've still got to provide him. Yes. You know, yeah, heating know. and hot water and that, so we can't yeah. just go and turn water off and say, sorry, it's not going to be on for three months. Because there is legislation. Yeah, and the, the council day, will be fining us. It, and, and it is someone's home, exactly. as annoying as it is. Yeah, yeah. So what did you do? What happened, what happened at that point where you've got this terrible, annoying tenant not paying any rent, potentially costing you thousands of pounds? Yeah, so I booked a mentoring call um, with Sue. Yeah. And she, I mean... Me being a Barnsley man just wanted to go in and evict him, <laughs> you know, to set lease. And she were like, you cannot do that. Yeah. Um, so she says, right, this is what you need to do. And basically, to cut a long story short, she got me to write up a very simple termination of deed for him to sign. And we told him he owed three months rent, which he didn't really owe to us anyway. He owed to previous, he only owed us about two or three weeks rent, which he'd not paid. So we said to him, you can live here for another two weeks, rent free, and we'll, we'll not chase you on the rent arrears if you agree to move out by said date. So we went and had a chat with him, we genuinely tried to help him out, this guy. He agreed to sign this termination of deed, and then come the day we were meant to move out, he, he'd not gone. So legally we could have got police in, because he was there as a, as a squatter, technically. We waited for him to leave the property and we changed the locks and I got all this stuff bagged up, we photoed it all first, bagged all this stuff up, put it in a, in a van and when he'd gone, he went up to council to go and see if they could help him out. He said he was, we don't think he was but whatever. We, we then called him and said where do you want your stuff dropping off and he absolutely hit roof and he come down, he brought the council with him. So we showed him this termination of deed and they literally just went, ah, where are you going to put his stuff? <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> so I says, I'll store his stuff free of charge. I've got a heated garage. I says, I'll put it in there. It can stop as long as he wants until he gets his thing sorted out. So yeah, we got rid of him, but I would not have known that unless I'd booked a mentoring call and spoke to Sue. Um, and she just made it so much easier. Because yeah. alternative it would have been take him to court, section eight, 
six months and him not paying rent builders are stalled everything had just you know it'd have gone airway yeah it, just, it shows the power of having mentors around you being on the yeah. academy being able yeah. to book mentoring goods because you never know do you when you yeah. might just suddenly need to you might yeah. not need a mentoring call for a few weeks then you suddenly need exactly 10. yeah yeah you know. still now i'll book something because everybody's really good at at certain things yeah no i don't think anybody knows everything yeah you need people around you because there's so many strategies and so many different avenues right. to go down yeah. that you need a big team around you. Yeah. If you Solicitors, want to be successful. accountants, yeah. experts in sales. Yeah. Sometimes people just say, I've got a deal, I'm struggling to sell it. Yeah, yeah, because they don't know how to sell. Yeah. yeah. You've got to have that network around you if you want to be super successful. Yeah. If you want to do all right in property and get to three grand a month coming in, you can eventually do it on your own over time and it's going to take you a long time. But... If you want to upscale and turn it into a business and make it completely hands off, you've got to have a good structure around you to, mm. to help. Well, I'm absolutely over the moon at your success and I'm really grateful that you, you know, you're giving back, even coming on Windows on a Wednesday. Yeah. The golden nuggets from this one have been huge. Yeah. So yeah. thanks so much. What will be your final words of wisdom or words of advice to someone that's wanting to get started into property? There's, I could say so much, um, but the, the key is to get the knowledge and get the get the people around you that's gonna that's gonna help lift you up because even in your day-to-day -day life your parents and your friends who are not into property they can't help you as much as they might want to help you they can't help you with the legalities and things like that you need successful people around you to drag you up quicker yeah. so yeah you need to get the knowledge you need to just not be trying to take it all on your own shoulders like our originally yeah because i'm yeah a Barnsley man and I thought you know I'll do it myself and that does not work you've got to have people helping you well, James thank you very much it's been a pleasure